Hello everybody, Dr. Yu here with the next video from the Calgary Guide video series, Pathogenesis of Diabetic Nephropathy. Before we get started, please help us reach more viewers by liking the video just as it's starting out and by subscribing to my channel. Just hit the subscribe button below the video. Diabetic nephropathy is a complication involving the kidneys that can arise as a result of type 1 or type 2 diabetes. Poor glycemic control resulting in chronic hyperglycemia has two main effects on the kidneys at the cellular level, known as the metabolic pathway, and on a more macro kidney level, known as the hemodynamic pathway. We'll talk about the metabolic pathway first. At the cellular level, in the kidney, more glucose in the bloodstream means increased glucose uptake and glycolysis by glomerular and tubular cells. This results in a complex series of mechanisms involving increased advanced glycation end products, shunting of glucose through non-glycolytic pathways, activation of protein kinase C pathway, and excessive production and accumulation of glycolytic intermediates, such as sorbitol, hexosamine, and succinate. All of these mechanisms result in increased oxidative stress, leading to increased free radical production. That results in activation of cellular signaling and transcription factors and cytokines. These cellular signaling molecules reduce the production of matrix metalloproteinases and increases the expression of aberrant extracellular matrix proteins, causing them to accumulate in the extracellular matrix. The reduced matrix metalloproteinases also mean that the extracellular matrix becomes less regulated, further worsening the accumulation of aberrant extracellular proteins in the extracellular matrix. Combined, this is known as the metabolic pathway. Aberrant extracellular matrix protein accumulation results, first of all, in mesangial matrix expansion. One sign of that, seen on pathology, are chemistyl Wilson lesions, which are pink highline nodules that are caused by the accumulation of damaged proteins in the extracellular matrix. This aberrant accumulation also results in tubular fibrosis, involving scarred glomeruli that are less able to effectively filter the blood, resulting in a reduced glomerular filtration rate, GFR, resulting, consequently, in diabetic nephropathy. Now let's talk about the hemodynamic pathway. Chronic hyperglycemia will increase the glucose load going to the kidney. Increased glucose in the proximal tubule will also result in the increased proximal tubule absorption of sodium because sodium and glucose are reabsorbed back into the blood via the same co-transporter. More reabsorption of sodium in the proximal tubule means less sodium going into the distal tubule, which results in the activation of tubuloglomerular feedback at the macula densa. Simultaneously, the excessive production and accumulation of glycolytic intermediates, such as succinate via GPR91, will result in the activation of the renin-angiotensin system. Both the activation of the renin-angiotensin system, as well as activation of the tubuloglomerular feedback at the macula densa, will result in increased intrarenal angiotensin II. Angiotensin II, of course, results in increased blood volume and blood pressure systemically, and also causes afferent arterial dilation and efferent arterial constriction resulting in an increased perfusion of the glomeruli. Therefore, initially in the pathogenesis of diabetic nephropathy, there will be an increase in the ability of the glomeruli to filter blood, corresponding to an increased glomerular filtration rate. Over time, the shear stress to the glomeruli, as a result of the pressure-induced damage from increased blood pressure and blood volume, will lead to both mesangial matrix expansion, resulting in kimmel wilson lesions on pathology, and also will lead to podocyte loss and injury, which in turn leads to increased glomerular basement membrane permeability to proteins like albumin. That results in albuminuria. And this is one of the reasons why diabetic nephropathy is the main cause of nephrotic syndrome. Please check out my video on nephrotic syndrome for more about the pathogenesis and clinical findings of nephrotic syndrome. Now, nephrotic syndrome features such as albuminuria typically occurs after five years from time of diagnosis in type 1 diabetes and can occur at the time of diagnosis in type 2 diabetes. Simultaneously, proteins in the tubules will be absorbed into tubular cells by endocytosis, which causes inflammation and subsequent tubular fibrosis. That results in scarred glomeruli, less able to effectively filter blood, resulting in a reduced glomerular filtration rate over time, and consequently, diabetic nephropathy. Note that overt diabetic nephropathy may take upwards of 15 to 20 years to develop after the onset of diabetes. And also note that the mechanisms presented here have been simplified. The crosstalk and signaling between the metabolic and hemodynamic factors do not manifest in a stepwise fashion, but rather they occur in parallel. And that's all for the pathogenesis of diabetic nephropathy. Please like and subscribe to my channel. For more on nephrology topics, you can check out my videos on nephrotic syndrome and pitting versus non-pitting edema, as well as other topics in the Calgary Guide video series playlist. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video.